This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, You'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a new patient called Bernardito. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good afternoon, doctor. I am Bernadito. Good afternoon. May I know what your problem is? I am having a severe stomach ache. What do you feel? I have heartburn and severe pain, doctor. Since when have you been feeling this acidity and pain? For the past two months. My stomach hurts after every meal. The pain persists even during nights. Have you eaten any heavy food or something different in the last two months? No, actually. How severe is the pain? Let's say on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you scale the severity of the pain? Well, I can say between 4 to 5. Is the pain continuous? No, it hurts only fleetingly. Do you feel the pain after meals? Yeah, probably, because it hurts every time after I eat. Is there any kind of food that bothers you much? Yeah, greasy food. Oh, I see. Yes, at home we eat a lot of greasy food. Where in the abdomen does it hurt? Tell me the exact point. Does the pain shift to your chest, shoulder, back, or across your abdomen? It hurts in the middle. At times, the pain moves across my abdomen. Besides the pain, you said you have heartburn? Yes, I feel a kind of sour taste whenever I burp. Do you feel like this more during the day or in the evenings? Both. I feel the acidity during the day and at night. Is it getting worse whenever you lie down? Yeah, I get an acid-like taste in my mouth. Besides greasy food, are you getting some irritation in your stomach when you eat in any other kind of food, like spicy food? No, actually, we don't eat spicy food at home. And tell me, how frequently do you have a bowel movement? No, it hasn't changed. It's regular. And tell me, how frequently do you have a bowel movement? And has there been any change in your bowel movements for the past two months? Yes, it has become a little bit softer. Is there any change in the color? Yeah, it is greener. Greener and not darker? Any blood in your bowel movement, or is it darker? Not darker. And there wasn't any blood in my bowel movement. Okay, let's first diagnose your abdomen to check from where the pain comes. You said you are feeling pain at the middle part of your abdomen. Correct. Does the pain stay there only, or does it move somewhere else? It usually stays there. Do you feel acidity and heartburn during the pain? Yeah, you were right. Do you have vomiting or nausea? No, not now. What did you eat today? I ate meat and tomato sauce. Do tomatoes give you any trouble? Not exactly. I have been eating tomato sauce always. Do you get any trouble when you have orange juice? Yeah, at times. How do you feel then? 
I get a strange metallic taste. You do not feel acidity then? No. Now, tell me, what do you do whenever you get stomach aches? I take Alka-Seltzer at times. That gives me a relief from the pain to some extent. Yeah, that should help with the relief. Do you take any Maalox, Tums, or Mylanta? No. Have you ever taken any medication on a consistent basis such as Advil, Aspirin, or Motrin? I was taking Tylenol usually. Okay. As I told you earlier, I am going to examine your feces to investigate whether you have any kind of parasite. Tell me, do you either come from the tropics or have you ever been traveling to any of the tropical regions or overseas? Yeah. Parasites that are found in most of the parts of the world affect the stomach. Besides, I want to check for any occult blood. You have mentioned earlier you haven't seen any changes in your feces and it's only greener and not darker. Sometimes, if you have a hemorrhage in your stomach, then the digested blood could produce a chemical reaction so that you can have occult blood in your feces. In such cases, we don't see the red color or dark color of the digested blood. Therefore, a diagnosis is essential. Moreover, I would like to diagnose your upper gastrointestinal system through x-rays and contrast. You will be given a thick substance to drink, and then the radiologist would observe how your liver digests the substance and observe your stomach movements. Because I think that your pain comes from your gallbladder and not from your stomach, I will have to do this kind of diagnosis. After a thorough investigation, let me decide whether I should take the x-ray test or an ultrasonic study of your gallbladder. Do not eat any greasy food for now, and also do not have your dinner just before going to bed because it could produce more acidity. Eat normal food and nothing spicy. I shall get back to you as I receive your medical reports from our lab. Anything else? With so many medical tests, I'm afraid I have an ulcer. I too have that kind of doubt. That is why I have suggested all these tests. I need to explain to you that an ulcer or other irritations in your upper intestines cannot be detected by x-ray at times. If the pain continues after having some antibiotics, you may have to go for an endoscopy. An endoscopy is a medical investigation in which a tube will be inserted through your mouth or nose, and then the specialist will observe your stomach, from the small intestines to the large one, and your gullet. Do you need any clarification? No, doctor. Thank you. Good. Let us meet next week. Goodbye. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Thomas Andrews. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Yes, good morning. What's your problem? Well, Doctor, I have a sinus problem. I get post-nasal drainage, facial pain, headaches, sore throat and congestion. Since how many days have you been facing this problem? For the past two weeks, Doctor. 
I'm also getting snoring, teeth pain and nasal burning. Is it moderate or severe? It worsens in the evening and morning. What's your age? 47, doctor. Did you have any illness previously or any surgeries? Yes, surgeries, gallbladder and hernia. Do you drink, smoke? I don't drink, but I smoke one pack of cigarettes per day for the past 15 years. Any of your family members have any illness? Yes, I have a family history of allergies and hypertension. What are the medications you are taking? Claritin, Dilantin and Rhinocort nasal spray. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Well... Your oracle's external auditory canals reveal no significant abnormalities bilaterally. TM's intact with no middle ear refusion and are mobile to insufflation. Your intranasal exam reveals moderate congestion and purulent mucus. Your oropharnics examination shows teeth. Alveolar ridges reveal missing molar. Examination of the posterior pharynx show a prominent uvulva and prominent postnasal drainage. The palatine tonsils are 2 plus and cryptic. The palpation of anterior neck reveals no tenderness. Examination of the posterior neck shows mild tenderness to palpation of the suboccipital muscles. Facial examination shows there is bilateral maxillary sinus tenderness to palpation. Waters view x-ray reveals bilateral maxillary mucosal thickening. You have acute maxillary sinusitis, 461.0. Snoring, 786.09. Well, I am prescribing you Augmentin. 875 milligrams twice a day and mucophen 800 milligrams twice a day follow these medications for three weeks and meet me after that if the conditions don't improve then i will order a mini sinus ct That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a discussion about common types of neuropathic pain. Now, read the question.
Hello, Doctor. What are the common types of neuropathic pain? Well, while there are countless types of neuropathic pain, some of the prominent types include carpal tunnel syndrome. It's caused by nerve compression in the wrists and causes pain in the wrist, thumb, and fingers. Central pain syndrome can occur after nervous system damage, such as a stroke. Degenerative disc disease. One may feel neuropathic back pain if it causes damage to the nerves entering or exiting the spine. Diabetic neuropathy causes stabbing pain in the hands and feet of some diabetic patients. Phantom limb pain can occur in some patients after a limb is amputated. Postherpetic neuralgia is brought on by an outbreak of shingles and persists after the condition has cleared. Pudendal neuralgia is a type of pelvic pain caused by compression of the pudendal nerve. Sciatica is caused by compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve and often results in shooting pain that radiates down the back of the leg. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by shooting neck and facial pain. Question twenty-six: You hear a discussion bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are often prescribed a bronchodilator, a type of medication for relaxing the air passages to help breathe better. Typically, the medications are inhaled through the mouth using a metered dose inhaler, but also come in liquid, pill, injectable, or suppository formulations. The three classes of bronchodilators commonly used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are beta adrenergic, beta agonists, anticholinergics, methylxanthines. Beta adrenergic agonists are a type of medication that binds to specific receptors in the lung, called beta adrenoceptors. By doing so, they block the trigger to bronchial spasms and allow airway passages to open. Beta agonists can either be short-acting or long-acting. Which are delivered either orally or through a metered dose inhaler. Generally, the inhaled method is preferred as it alleviates symptoms faster. Anticholinergic blocks the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the central and the peripheral nervous system to its receptor in nerve cells and inhibit parasympathetic nerve impulses. Methylxanthines affect not only the airways but stimulate heart rate, force of contraction, and cardiac arrhythmias at high concentrations. Question twenty-seven: You hear a discussion about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastrinoma usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastrinomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body, or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucagenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucagenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. Somatostatinomas, which makes somatostatin. Question twenty-eight: You hear a discussion about melasma and different types of melasma. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is melasma, and what are the types of melasma? Well, melasma is a common patchy brown, tan, or blue-gray facial skin discoloration, normally seen in women during their reproductive period. 
It typically appears on the upper lips, upper cheeks, forehead, and chin of women of 20 to 50 years of age. There are four types of pigmentation patterns are diagnosed in melasma. Epidermal, dermal, mixed, and an unnamed type found in dark-complexioned individuals. The epidermal type is characterized by the presence of excess melanin in the superficial layers of skin. Dermal melasma is defined by the presence of melanophages throughout the dermis. The mixed type includes both the dermal and epidermal type. In the fourth type, excess melanocytes are present in the skin of dark-skinned individuals. Question 29. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. Can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 30. You hear a monologue of a physician on granulomas. Now, read the question. Granulomas are tissue nodules of immune cells that occur in diseases such as sarcoidosis and tuberculosis that can damage many organs. It is the chronic activation of the metabolic sensor mammalian target of rapamycin that is responsible for the granuloma's formation. In sarcoidosis, this mechanism leads to a course that is chronic and difficult to treat. Since mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors belong to a group of drugs already licensed for clinical use, these findings offer new and quickly testable treatment options. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic of cystic hygromas. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 31 to 36.
Cystic hygromas are fluid-filled sacs that commonly occur on the neck or head of a baby as a result of blockages in lymphatic system. At times, cystic hygromas are detected through ultrasounds during pregnancy. Some cystic hygromas may not appear until the child grows. Cystic hygromas affect 1 in 800 pregnancies and 1 in 8,000 live births. In 80% of cases, cystic hygromas appear on the face, including the neck, head, cheek, mouth, or tongue. It can usually grow in other parts of the body, including the chest, armpits, buttocks, legs, and groin. Usually cystic hygromas that are present at birth or develop after birth are benign. However, they can be disfiguring, glow very large, and affect a child's ability to swallow and breathe. At times, cystic hygromas detected during pregnancy go away before birth. A fetal cystic hygroma can be a risk factor for miscarriage. Although usually cystic hygromas affect children, there are rare cases of their appearance in adults. In a remarkable case, a 32-year-old man had a cystic hygroma on his neck that appeared eight months before diagnosis. He was experiencing severe pain and swelling in the right lower part of his face that extended to his neck. Biopsy confirmed it was an adult-onset cystic hygroma. Environmental and genetic factors caused the formation of cystic hygromas, mainly viral infections transmitted to a fetus during pregnancy or drug and alcohol consumption during pregnancy are the causes for cystic hygroma formation. However, most of the cystic hygromas are due to genetic conditions, especially due to chromosomal abnormalities accounted for in 50% of the cases. Genetic causes for cystic hygroma are Turner syndrome is a condition where a woman is partially or completely missing an X chromosome, causing change in appearance and problems related to the fertility and heart. Patients with Noonan syndrome may have unusual facial features, bleeding problems, heart issues, short stature, skeletal abnormalities, and many other symptoms. Trisomy 13, 18, or 21, these conditions cause the embryo to develop an additional set of chromosomes that produce a variety of congenital abnormalities, including intellectual disability. Depending on the location of the cysts, the symptoms of a cystic hygroma may vary. Some children may not even experience any symptoms other than its growth. The most common method of diagnosing cystic hygromas is ultrasound imaging. Usually cystic hygromas are diagnosed when the fetus is still in the womb during a routine abdominal ultrasound. It is also detected in a blood test carried out at 15 to 20 weeks. If the blood test result shows high levels of alpha fetoproteins, it might be an indication of cystic hygroma. Although ultrasound images may indicate the possible location and size of a cystic hygroma, additional diagnosis may be required for obtaining more information such as depth and severity of the growth and any obstructions that can indicate a breathing problem. A transvaginal probe method can take better images of the cystic hygroma without the obstruction of other organs in the way. Fast spin magnetic resonance imaging can provide a clear image and more details about the cystic hygroma. During amniocentesis test, a doctor will collect amniotic fluid through a special needle for testing chromosomal abnormalities. Normally, there is no need for any treatment for a cystic hygroma, as long as it is not causing any health issues. Sclerotherapy is one treatment option in which a specialist injects a chemotherapeutic agent called bleomycin into the cystic hygroma to shrink its growth. However, it may take several therapy sessions for this to happen. Moreover, a cystic hygroma can also grow back. A surgical removal of cystic hygroma may be considered only when the child grows a bit older. However, surgery can cause significant scarring and complications such as damage to nerves, arteries, blood vessels, and structures near the cystic hygroma. In case the cystic hygromas have associations with other genetic conditions that may impact the development of the child, cystic hygromas can grow back even after surgery, treatment, especially if the cyst cannot be removed completely during the pregnancy.
Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on refractive error. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello doctor, what is refractive error and what are the types of refractive error? Well, a refractive disorder is an ocular condition caused by changes in the eye shape that prevents light from being focused sharply on the retina, creating vague images. The causes may range from congenital shortening or lengthening of the eyeball through variations in the shape of the cornea to anomalies of the lens. During the process of refraction, the light bends when passing through the cornea and the lens. This helps direct light from the objects we view exactly on the macula, the part of the retina that has the maximum number of cone cells, which are the photoreceptors responsible for detailed and sharp vision. Myopia, or short-sightedness, happens when the eye refracts light so much that the rays converge to a spot in the front of the retina, leading to a blurred image when one looks at objects that are beyond a certain distance. However, objects that are close can be seen clearly, as the light rays are divergent at their origin, and so undergo the right amount of refraction. The eyeball in such people may be too long, or the cornea may be bulged more than usual, leading to the focusing of light before it reaches the retina. The condition is usually diagnosed in childhood, between 8 and 12 years, it stabilizes in the years between 20 and 40 in most cases. A family history of myopia may predispose to the condition. It is correctable using prescription eyeglasses, contact lenses, or refractive surgery such as, carot such as keratoplasty. People with high myopia have a greater risk of future retinal detachment. Hypermetropia is also called long-sightedness, that occurs when light rays reflect too little and so focus beyond the retina, leading to poor vision for near objects. However, light from more distant objects is parallel and so usually comes to a focus at the retina with this lower level of refraction. Some hyperopic people cannot see well regardless of the distance of the object. The eyeball may be shorter or the cornea flatter than usual, or the lens may have less refractive power than is normal. Like myopia, eyeglasses, contact lenses, or surgery may be recommended for correction. Astigmatism is a condition in which the shape of the cornea is uneven. For example, it may be curved more in one direction than the other, or show areas where different curvatures. As a result, light rays are scattered and come to focus at different spots on the retina, 
rather than forming a single sharp image. This leads to blurry vision. Eyeglasses are usually recommended, but contact lenses to smooth the refractive surface and refractive surgery to chisel the cornea to a smooth contour may also work well. Presbyopia is a refractive error caused due to aging. As the lens inside the eye ages, it loses its power to change shape with the pull of the ciliary muscles in response to the need for greater or less refractive capability. As a result, it becomes less able to accommodate itself so as to focus light from nearby objects clearly. Near vision becomes a problem, leading to the characteristic picture of people over the age of 35 or 40 holding books farther away than usually in order to see them come clearly. Eyeglasses are the best way to correct presbyopia. Bifocal glasses have two different refractive powers, with the lower part being designed for reading and the upper part designed for distant vision. This is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.